Westminster and pretty much the Fraser Valley. Um, they would have magazines that covered Chilliwack and magazines, in this case being a, a weekly tabloid paper, um, quite along the lines of what the Royal City Record or the news is of the world would be today. Um, so I'll start off with this photo. This is a RCAF, so Canadian Air Force uh, de Havilland Comet, uh, tail number 106, or sorry, uh, this airplane 106, which is tail number 5301. The nice thing you'll find about airplanes is they have unique numbers on them and you can find out where they went and often how they crashed. This one luckily did not. It was retrofitted to the more modern version that did not suffer a catastrophic hull failure because of metal fatigue. Um, and it's one of the prettier airplanes. Uh, this was uh, June of 1953. It had flown in from Calgary uh, in one hour and 10 minutes. So I will start off. We'd like to, acknowledge, or to start by acknowledging the land we learn and live and play on is the traditional unceded territory of the Hamalkan speaking Coast Salish people. This refers to a language group that more widely encompasses the Indigenous people who used and continue to use this land and includes such nations as the Kikite, Kwantlen, Kaitsi, Coquitlam, Musqueam, Stolo, Sawasan, and Salil Watuf, which is a fun one to say. So the reason we're here is the staff of the British Columbian newspaper. Um, we have at the center, uh, Dorothy Taylor, who was the publisher, and her son was the last publisher uh, and closed the paper in the early to mid 1980s. Uh, this would be mostly the office staff and writers. Uh, this is 1950, which you can tell from the Great Northern um, Railway calendar behind. These are some of the other people that would have been the less sung heroes. Uh, the blue collar staff um, of the print shop and probably commercial printing unit. Um, we'll go back to an inset of the it's rare to find photos of photographers, but here is our subject today, Frank Goodship. And he was a motorsport enthusiast, which his widow who sent us the photos later wanted us to know. And here we have an unknown woman leaning against uh, his modified MG Roadster. You can see his press license plate and what we think is a external oil cooler. Um, there are many pictures in the collection of little roadsters touring the province. So we'll start off with one of the big things that's left New Westminster, and that's the port. This is a view from the spring of 1953. Uh, we're looking eastward, um, sorry, we're looking from the east uh, to the west. Um, so the eastern waterfront is not typically photographed. Uh, this is probably off the Patello Bridge approach. Um, things you can notice in the distance, the Brackman Kerr, we've got the CKNW sign, which is on the, um, near the, I think it's in the Forsts building, um, which some of you might remember Frosty Forst, that was his family's furniture company, our furniture sale company. Um, it was, the port was the reason why the city was here for so long, and it was a drastic change when it left. Here we have an example of some of the ships coming. We have the captain of the Hein Hoyer, which is an interesting case in that that ship was sunk in 1940 at the Battle of uh, Narvik in Norway. It was eventually refloated, and here it is back as a German trading vessel loading up with lumber uh, from the docks. Um, we will, this was actually a published paper, or sorry, a published uh, photograph which is one of the advantages of news photographer, uh, having a news, news photographs, they quite often got published. So you can go back and look at microfiche and go a bit cross-eyed, but try to find the caption information. Uh, so much of that gets lost with family photos. It makes me a little sad. So more uh, cargo photos. Uh, this is the Federal Voyager out of Montreal. We can also see Buckerfields. This is probably Hello. close. 
This is probably close to um, where the Samson 5 is currently birthed, um, but it's a little hard to tell from the, I'm not the best on the dot. Uh, another view, and this always astounds me, of how they would load the old ships. They didn't have the advanced loading technology, but they could put people on barges on, on, the, on the water side so they could load from uh, the load from barges. It made it very interesting if a boat went by at a high rate of speed because those barges start moving. And some of the news stories uh, would mention, and, or it would be a photo of someone who got thrown off a, a, a barge when they were loading or got thrown off between the ship and the barge, which is even more dangerous. Uh, one of the stories that seemed to be well documented, I think I tracked it down to being the winter of 1954, uh, this being January 28th, uh, there was a very large heavy snow. So there were a large number of photos of here's the snow getting higher and higher and higher, uh, people pretending to golf on the hills of 6th Street in about three feet of snow, and pictures of bald tires. Uh, so even the dock had to keep working uh, during the snow. It just would have been very unpleasant, I imagine. More views. This is still uh, January of 1954. And this is a, one, of, one of my favorite views. So we are looking west towards, you can just see the Patella Bridge in the background. We've got Brackman Kerr. Um, this would be most of the fishing fleet, at least the mainland portion of it. There would be another group out of what's now Sapperton Landing Park and others from Queensboro. Uh, this is just where the photo is taken from is probably one side of the government dock which the Department of Public Works, which ha ha floated the Samson, as well as the Essington briefly, the King George, the Dredge King George and other boats. So a lot of the infrastructure of the port and the Frolour Fraser River was built out of New Westminster. And this would be very close to where the Samson would berth today. So looking towards what would now be River Market. Just showing some of the further industry that was around. So with fit, when there's fishing, you had to tend to nets. So there were net houses, loft, well, loft houses is more shipbuilding, but you had to tend to ships. This is fisherman Alfred Hansen inspecting his fishing nets on a wharf shack. And we also have uh, fishermen showing, um, selling fish on the 8th Street dock, uh, straight from the boat. So not something that really happens very much anymore. New Westminster was also a heavily, heavily into the uh, logging industry or processing. Uh, there were numerous mills up until soon starting to go in the 80s and a couple limped on into, 19, into the 90s and most now gone by 2000, except of course for Kruger, uh, formerly Scott, and before that Royal City Paper. And it is a bit disconcerting seeing the safety measures or lack of them from this, now the 50s. Um, it would not really happen today, but it at least makes an interesting photo. So we're now on Columbia Street at the then intersection of McNeely and Columbia. McNeely is the overpass currently to uh, Keyside Drive. Uh, we have the Westminster Trust Block, which remains. Uh, where the Safeway is, is uh, close to the, the mall around Skytrain Station. Anvil Center would be about here. It really seems that there are about four photos people take of New Westminster. It's always Columbia Street looking east, but always from about there. Uh, we don't usually get this portion of 8th Street showing, and it's almost never the reverse shot. But New Westminster was a bit of a city on the move and on the go. You can just see CKNW sign at the back. 
Uh, we've got the CPR station, and more importantly for the next series of photos, the BCER station. New Westminster's always been at the center of New Westminster, uh, sorry, at the center of the Lower Mainland. Our traffic attests to that. So from that hub, you could go, uh, of course, all the way into Vancouver, but as far out as Chilliwack in the old interurban and street, local streetcar systems. This is a somewhat rare photo uh, right near the end of a view through the BCER building. So this was later um, known as Value Village and now is the Salvation Army. So we're looking through the back towards Columbia Street. Uh, you can see the Safeway there, which is by Skytrain Station today. And McNeely, uh, McLennan, McNeely and Pryor, I believe is that building there. So you can see they've already taken out two of the lines and have replaced them with buses as the rail to road conversion uh, was going on. And this presented a bit of a problem because most of the buses, and especially the now distance buses, which were the Pacific Stage Lines, then later Greyhound, uh, they loaded from a terminal across the railway tracks, which were still being used as we're an active port. So there were newspaper stories, and these were the photos to support that, of building a new replacement. And so many of these photos all start with, a, it's it's because of the times, it's usually a man, it's usually a politician, and they're pointing. And they're always pointing, I like to think, to the future. So this is the old Central School, which if you're an old time New Westminsterite, right, like I just barely qualify now. Uh, this is where the Salvate, or sorry, the uh, YMCA was located which doesn't mean much to most people. So this is the t are the townhouses above uh, the Royal Towers Hotel. Uh, this had been a school location for probably five or six different schools. They kept changing the names. I believe it was a John Robson, possibly a Richard McBride at one point. It was Central. Um, it's mostly known as Central. So here we have uh, on the left, um, BCER Public Relations EF Ted Fox, and on the right, Ivor Neal, who is the BC Electric President of Motor Transport. And this was in the paper April 9th of 1951. And what are they pointing to? The new bus terminal that needs to be built. It was a joint BCER and Pacific Stage Lines. This is on the site of what would today be the Royal Towers Hotel, even though it's not a hotel, I'll still always call it that. So at 6th and Royal Avenue. Uh, we'll also quite ex explain why there's some very odd ramps uh, in the construction of the building today. Uh, but this was going to be a fancy new station that would serve for the, I guess, the rest of time. Here are some of the ramps, which if you've ever looked across Royal, the view from Royal, it's very strange. There are these large sweeping ramps that go seemingly nowhere. It makes more sense if you realize it used to be a bus terminal. So you can just see, I think Central School is remaining still above. It later would become, as I said, the YMCA. When I moved here into the 80s, uh, it was closed and had last been used as a hostel for Expo 86 employees, I think. And as the shift uptown, while well, there are still people who want to go downtown, so we have a Columbia Street Merchants Shopper Special going from Columbia Street to the PSL Depot up the hill. And I'll go, this, so this is 1953, the first day of service. I'll go back in time a little bit to the construction era, uh, just to prove, oh, this proves a couple things. So we've got, first off, the new improvement of the new city hall being built uptown on the current location. And you've also, this is also one of our two photos that will show Duke of Connaught High, or old Duke of Connaught High School. This is thought, to, this is around 1952. The new high school has already opened uptown. That would be uh, Vincent, no, uh, Lester Pearson, uh, today part of um, New Westminster Se Seniors, sorry, secondary school. Um, 
but their bets in the in in the past had been won over photos like this, which everyone had apparently thought that Duke of Connaught was torn down and City Hall was built on top of it. They existed at the same time. So because there's a new City Hall coming, you have to document the old City Hall in your newspaper. So this is November 9th, 1953. Um, photograph shows the men of the engineering department of New Westminster standing at a large desk covered in plans. This is the old city hall, which would currently be on the location of the new police station or the current police station. Um, we can see the slightly the Imperial Bank of Commerce in the background and of course the Columbia Theater back when it was a movie house. Um, there are other oddities if you focus in on their desk. Uh, you can see ashtrays and I think they're also laughing, so someone's cr cracked a joke probably. Uh, I've always liked this photo. We had it in a print form for many years from the city collection long before we actually got the original negatives and it was quite a treat to find this. We also have further administration areas of some of the clerks of the city. And here we have our old council chambers, which are very small. Um, we've got the, the mayor, Toby Jackson, and the city administrator, who I never remember his name. And a group of, it looks like a mix of council and other members. This is also the first view of an artifact we have in our collection. Way over on the corner there is the bell of the HMCS New Westminster, a World War II Corvette. Um, it is currently displayed in the gallery of the New Westminster Museum, which I'll also remind you, you can have, is available for booking appointments to come view. We're open again, we will be pleased to see you. So along with other changes that are being planned. Well, there's big changes coming for the Patello Bridge. They're going to build um, essentially the McBride we know of today. The one problem is there was a war memorial at the head of it. Uh, so the war memorial has to get picked up and moved. And it must have, I'll, you'll see in some photos coming up, it was a different view then. Um, here are some of the plans and uh, of course we have a politician boldly looking towards the future. That is Mayor Toby Jackson who oversaw this very influential time. A lot of New Westminster is changing. It's probably known by some that the port is probably dying and not coming back. Advancements in containerization were just starting at this time. New Westminster is getting its new city hall and we're moving uptown uh, and getting away from, I guess, the soon to be bleak downtown. And we also have the cenotaph being replaced in the front of the New Westminster City Hall where he remains today. So you have to now start documenting the new city hall and we've got the beautiful vista in the old closed off where you can now go to pay or can go to pay bills and pay for your licenses. Um, if you haven't been in in a while, they're basically recreating what is now on this side on the farce on the side where the photographer is standing and it's going to be open and much more inviting. To the left, we have the second artifact that's now in our gallery. So the stained glass window uh, was taken from old city hall for a very long time, hung over the door in front of the new city hall. And it's now currently in the gallery of the museum. And having dealt with it in the past, that is not a good situation to be in. It's a very heavy window. It's very delicate. I'm very scared for those two men up on a ladder, but obviously things worked out okay. So we have this, which is probably the last, um, it must be one of the last uh, Remembrance Days at the old site. So you can see it was right at the end of the Patello Bridge, which did lead for some interesting photos as, and I'm sure some astounding accidents. 
and we go from the old New Westminster to new New Westminster. City Hall is not yet open. This is November 11th, 1953. It's the first Remembrance Day at the new plaza in front of the Royal, uh, the Royal Street, Royal Avenue location of City Hall. And I'll go to another odd throwback photo of earlier with City Hall under construction, no cenotaph, a large parade of civil defense tractor trailers, which were put on display on Columbia Street, and then a much better view of Duke of Connaught. Um, and kind of nestled there off into the trees. It will lead me to some photo. I'll talk about now some photos I'm not showing. Um, these are the namesakes of our then junior high. So Vincent Massey, the first Canadian born Governor General. And then we have Lester Pearson, uh, Prime Minister, who would be uh, the, both would be the namesake for the junior high and for the senior high. Um, with uh, Lester Pearson, that's again Toby Jackson, Mayor Toby Jackson. And we have a uh, liberal uh, MP and former councillor, then alderman, uh, Bill Mott, uh, who would stay in government just until the wave of Socrates came in and saw him removed. I could have added some photos of Mr. Mott pointing at this building. This is the, at what now would be the old post office. Uh, so this is 6th and Columbia Street. We've got 6th going up, Columbia Street across. Beside it is the old City Hall. So the left portion of the building is City Hall. The right portion, and getting a closer look, is was the fire department. The fire department by this point, 1953, has moved out and is in a different location on Clarkson. Uh, behind City Hall on the back portion is where the then police station was. So there behind, you can just see a little sliver of the new federal building, which replaced a former little, very cute little cottagey federal building. Um, many people might not have realized that, so this is now, uh, the post office was rebuilt into a building that matched the federal building. And then another corner in the back was built, which means that the police station is actually two or three buildings that have all grown in together. Um, and this is more moder modernization of the city. So instead of a interesting building that was probably not very comfortable inside, you get kind of a slabbed front uh, modern modernist building. Other changes that are going on at the time, this is the, built, the start of BC Tell's Uptown facility, where they're touting the brand new automatic telephone exchange. So it would have been very strange dealing with operators. Um, this, and it was very strange when I moved to New Westminster and we had a very early direct dial system. And if you wanted to call an, another old area, say in Vancouver, it was occasionally a very long wait to get lines, uh, to get a, a line to connect. So this is, I believe would now be, I'm not 100% sure if this portion of the building remains, but probably. And what they're replacing is a setup like this. So th this is a different example. This is Miss Beryl Ward, chief operator, but you can see all the stools and all the work terminals for all the operators who, if you don't know, you would pick up a phone, maybe hit the hook a couple times, and you would wait for an operator to pick up and they would ask you who you wanted to call. New Westminster was Lakeview, so 5-2 translates to LA, so we would be Lakeview 1 or like view two, and then you would say the rest of your number. Occasionally in small enough areas, you could just ask for someone. Direct dial would of course see all this go away, but this is a bit more of an interesting story. This is from February 10th, 1951. And unfortunately, uh, there was a fire in a closet uh, in the basement of the phone uh, building. And she got to, so everyone evacuated, Miss Beryl Lord was the stayed on. She would run from being at the window where she could breathe, 
would then run in to answer a phone and say, she said, this is the telephone company, please hang up and don't use the phone between going back to the window for fresh air. So you don't think about it, but if the operators can't be in the operation, in the, in the operator room, uh, you, your phone calls don't get through. If you're calling, making an emergency call, you need someone there. Further improvements were going on. We have the old Simon Fraser uh, Health Clinic, which has recently been torn down, uh, having moved up another wave to the future. They've moved uptown again. Um, you can see we have a chest clinic because the scourge of tuberculosis was foremost um, at the time. And what they're getting ready to build is the new extension I believe this might have been the Gyro Club sponsored extension. They were a local club that uh, did a lot of fundraising. Further movements uptown are heralded by the building of Woodward's. So this is the corner of 6th and 6th, uh, 6th Street going this way, 6th Avenue that way, and there's the Woodward's building, little clock extension uh, being built. You'll notice the road isn't really paved, which is a bit surprising, and we've just got a stop sign pounded in in front of, oh, I can't remember what the name of the drugstore was, but I believe it was run by Mimi Evers, who would be, later be a mayor. And Uptown is changing now. We've got some views of the fashion plate models uh, being captured for the new store. Um, I just vaguely remember being in the mall in Woodward's um, before it closed. Um, I knew two local women who their dream was to, when they retired, there was a little bench off on one side. And when they, they wanted to be the old ladies who got to retire and sit at that bench at the Woodward's. Unfortunately, I believe they're still working and there's now no Woodward's to go into, but there's still a mall. There are plenty. And here is the opening of the mall of Woodward's. Uh, we're on 6th Avenue, um, probably just above 7th, I believe, it would, probably 7th. So you could have driven probably straight into the food floor parking lot along there. And again, a huge crowd. In our next series, I believe we have photos that greater document the opening. Though I'm not sure if they've been scanned yet. And in, in Woodward's, we have what we believe to be the cafeteria. I don't remember ever seeing it. I don't think it was still there when I came along, but I do remember some of the aspects of the food floor. It didn't seem so bunkerish when I was there, but here is the brand new and advanced uh, Woodward's food floor. We've got a store directory, which would be a vast improvement uh, on the cart, and all the modern soups that one could need. Uh, lots of clam chowder and abatant soup. So there are other areas, New Westminster, if you take the global view, New Westminster used to be New Westminster District, which means we could count, oh, probably as far out as Chilliwack. There are also parts of Burnaby that grew out of New Westminster. There are also parts of Surrey that grew out of New Westminster. Well, this is part of the history of, the, of Burnaby, um, which, or to some, South Westminster, at least for a bit of it. Uh, this is, uh, we only know the name of Kaya uh, uh, Kalevala on the left and two unidentified male drivers because you probably didn't know, but near McPherson and Rumble, around where the Terry Fox uh, Theater is or McPherson School and Park, uh, there was a racetrack called Digney Speedway. Um, lots of very interesting stock cars uh, going through the paces and Frank, being a newspaper photographer and motorsports enthusiast, would of course go there. 
Uh, this is a coupe converted into a speed rate racer, car number 22, owned and driven by Mel Keene. Uh, this is May of 1953, and this was page 19 of the Columbian. Have a bit of a view of the paddock and some more racing action. Uh, I wish I'd grown up when there was a speedway in Burnaby. Unfortunately, I never quite got there. So, as I mentioned, this is part of New Westminster, part of Burnaby that grew out from the New Westminster area. This is part that grew out of into Surrey. So this beautiful, idyllic, pastoral looking church, St. Helen's Anglican Church, uh, still stands in Surrey. It's at, I believe the intersection of, uh, it's on 108th where it transitions into Yale Road, Old Yale Road. Looks like something out of Midsummer Murders to my view. But just below in what was, so this would be considered the Bridgeview area. So the high area was Bridgeview. The lower area was Brownsville. And this just looks so beautiful to my eye. And you might notice a couple things that are ominous, especially here when you go in and see, that's the Patello Bridge. So this beautiful, decorated park and canal is currently the intersection of Scott Road and King George Highway. You can see the Turf Hotel right about there, which still remains. Um, I know in the 50s, by the time my father had moved out post-war with his father, um, they would usually, it was there, his mother, sorry, my grand, my grand, my father's grandmother lived in White Rock. That was about a day's journey from Vancouver. You would get usually to about New Westminster or just across in Surrey, and this would be where you'd have your lunch. And it was just such an idyllic, go back again, such an idyllic little neighborhood. Yeah, it makes me sad when you realize it just got then turned into auto wreckers. And, but, we at least still have some photos. We have now some teen hijinks in downtown New Westminster. This is a snake parade, which I described in the photo as an impromptu conga line. Uh, this is on Columbia Street at Church Street. Uh, we can see the Fraternal Order of Elks Hall, uh, as, long as, as well as King Edward Hotel, uh, the Burr Block Apartments, as well as uh, the Sun Tower atop it. And way in the background again, Forsts and the students, uh, I guess, feeling their oats, had a big conga line through the traffic of Columbia Street. Uh, this is the lower portion, so we're now looking the same direction, but you now you can see the Columbia Theater, the Bank of Commerce, as well as I believe what was originally the Bank of BC, first Bank of BC building, and down the hill, uh, down to Front Street. And here it is breaking up as they run away. We did find there's the, there was one box that I realized at the end that I scanned right at the end, and it was some of uh, Frank Goodship's treasured photos. Um, this wasn't one of them, but I feel it should have been there. I'm a bit of a sucker for the heroic view of a bridge or subject, as you'll see next. Um, this is just a nice picture of the bridge in the of, of a foggy bridge, a slightly foggy bridge. This is also another subject he captured. Um, this is Harnan Singh, age 25, uh, shown in September 25 of 1952. Uh, he is now one month having come from India and his military service, and he's now farming on the Sumas Prairie. Uh, Again, I like the heroic imagery, and it's just a very nice photo. They're also always taking quirky photos because it's a newspaper. So, well, let's get a picture of an old order nun buying some Christmas cards. Uh, this was published December 18th of 1952. I'm not sure of the store. It has the feeling of Woolworths, but there was also a Kresge's, so it could have been that. 
uh, and this is now coming to one of his Frank's chosen beauty shots. Um, this is the line of and crowd anticipating the visit or the passing by of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip in 1951. We've got the then Eaton store. Uh, later it would become Salvation Army, which is not Salvation Army, Army and Navy, which has just closed. It was originally built um, as a Spencer's. Uh, Eaton's was looking to buy existing stores to expand east or westward. They bought the uh, Spencer's stores, which is why Eaton's in the west coast for a while tended to have food floors. Um, but it's just a very, I love the view of this photo. Another subject captured, unfortunately, we don't know his name, but we know what he is. Um, it was titled Lasker by Trade, Indian by Birth. This is February 17th, 1951. The term, and this is a, a winch operator, so he would have helped loading and unloading the ships. A Lasker is a broad term, which originally starts off as sailors from India who worked mostly on English ships, a bit of unfortunate carry on from the old English system. You're a bit more like property than would be comfortable today. Um, and, in, and then it was a term that was applied more broadly to other, other sailors in different, from different regions in different regions. But this is one of the rare color positives uh, that we scanned. And it was a term I'd never heard, Lasker. And then you find out from reading in Wikipedia, there's not, of course, there isn't going to be much mention of them because from 1914 to 1943, they weren't allowed to be in British Columbia or Canada. They were specifically prohibited from leaving ships. But, and it's a beautiful photo that was published in the Columbian Magazine. One of my favorite views, we of course get down to Columbia and 8th Street again. We've got the BCER building, and this would be the site of currently Anvil Center, of which I'm sitting in today. Uh, go a bit more of a view. So we've got cafes and Montreal Star newspaper signs. The Army and Navy is currently uh, in what is now the, um, can't think of the name of the trap block, uh, which was redeveloped recently. And of course, a nice bus to Queensboro. Uh, now this is Newestminster's, I suppose, forgotten train station. Uh, this is just off the bridge approach uh, between Front and Columbia Street. Um, this was the Great Northern Railway Station. Um, just a beautiful sh nighttime shot taken by Frank. And this is, this is a, he had about four or five versions of this photo. This is a more or less uncropped image, but I think, oh, no, that one, go with that one. Uh, a varieties of a, a variety um, of different versions of this were around. Uh, this is on the left Tony Duff of Watling Street, and on the right Bill Blate, Bill Bates, sorry, also of uh, Watling Street. I believe that I can't remember where that is now. Um, but this is the Sixth Street Dock, and. Just a really nice, maybe somewhat contrived um, photo, but one I quite like. And I've printed it and posted it at a number of desks I've had and workspaces. So this is most of the, this is, has been the presentation. I'll leave it on this one of Frank's keepers um, from his final box of photos. Um, so I would like to thank Frank Goodship. Well, thank you for attending. And I'd like to thank Frank Goodship. Uh, so Frank died in 1990. A couple of years later, uh, his wife, Jean, happened to send this shoebox of negatives, just 
in the blind and it found its way to us at Irving House. This presentation has shown you just 72 of the nearly 2,400 photos scanned. So that's about 3%. Uh, these were all scanned over a couple months in 2011. Uh, Frank left commercial photography in 1954. He then worked for the, went to work for the very recently opened CBC Television in Vancouver. Um, I could add in, he, he did take some photos of the early studios in the old Hotel Vancouver. Uh, he would then briefly work for Ghana Broadcasting under a Canadian aid program uh, before going to work for UNESCO, uh, where he remained until he died in 1990, uh, shortly after his 64th birthday in Geneva. And luckily, Jean managed to send these, uh, this box of treasured negatives from almost 50 years earlier uh, to us in New Westminster. Uh, he did shoot mostly in a Graphex uh, Speedflex camera, shooting a mixture of, and obviously he had a, a smaller European camera, um, but we are, we're talking large format photos and some medium format photos. Um, and because of that, it's before zoom lenses. So it's just a large picture and you have to pick the crop out the right photo from the middle of it. So I hope he would agree um, that I've cropped these properly. I've also had to crop them horizontally for your presentation here today. And that is the presentation. So thank you very much. I will Oh, where do I want to go? I'll stop sharing this and oh.